Hello everyone, I'm going to talk to you about the power and limits of dynamic pricing in combinatorial markets. This is joint work with Alon Eden and my advisor, Professor Michal Feldman. So let's start by talking about the, our model, which is that of a combinatorial market. A combinatorial market consists of M indivisible goods. So these fruits on the right, for example. There are N buyers, each of which has a valuation function mapping each subset of the goods to a real number. And you can think of this uh, number or value as the amount of money that the buyer is willing to pay for the bundle of goods. An allocation is simply some partition of the goods among the agents or buyers. And one goal that we can think about in this uh, model is to maximize social welfare. That is, we want to find an allocation that maximizes the sum of the values that the buyers have for the bundles that they received. Now, in this talk, we will mainly focus about the class of multi-demand valuations. What are these valuations? So a valuation VI is called K demand for some number K if it is additive on the favorite, uh, on the top K uh, items in the bundle. So VI of some bundle S will be to take the maximum uh, among all subsets S prime of S of size at most K and summing up uh, the values of the items in S prime. And when K equals one, this definition simply collapses to unit demand. And I also want to mention that multi-demand is a subclass of growth substitutes. Now in this work, we want to maximize social welfare in combinatorial markets. And we want to do so using item pricing or posted price mechanisms. In this mechanism, a designer chooses the item prices, P1 to PM, a price for every item. Then after the prices are set, buyers start arriving uh, in a sequential manner to the market in some arbitrary order. And each buyer takes some demanded bundle or a favorite bundle. I'm going to use the term demanded bundle or a bundle in demand or a favorite bundle in, uh, interchangeably in this talk. And what I mean by that is some bundle that maximizes the utility given the prices. So the utility of a bundle S given prices P is the value of S minus the sum uh, of the prices of the items in S. And the assumptions that we make in this work is that the valuation profile is an entirely known to the designer, but the arrival order of the buyers and the tie-breaking choices they make between different bundles, uh, between different uh, favorite bundles, this is unknown and can be adversarial. And the designer's goal is to set prices such that the obtained allocation in the end of the process maximizes social welfare for every arrival order and every tie-breaking choices by the buyers. This brings us to the uh, well-researched uh, solution concept that is called the Walrasian equilibrium. So a Walrasian equilibrium is a pair of an allocation and item prices such that for every I, AI is a favorite bundle of I, and also all items are allocated. And I want to show you an example of a market that has a Walrasian equilibrium. So consider this example, which has two uh, buyers, Alice and Bob, and two items, one and two. Both Alice and Bob are unit demand, and the values that they have for both items is written on their respective edges. I claim that this market has a world resin equilibrium. For example, uh, consider the allocation uh, that uh, allocates item one to A to Alice, item two to Bob, and prices uh, item one at R minus one and item two at zero then I claim that this is a Walrasian equilibrium. You can verify that both uh, buyers uh, derive a utility of one from the items that they get, and they can't do any better. So this is a Walrasian equilibrium. And the nice thing about Walrasian equilibria is that Walrasian allocations maximize social welfare. This is the so-called first welfare theorem. So a begging question is whether we can use Walrasian pricing to solve the uh, item pricing problem that I presented to you before? And the answer is no. So assume, for example, that the designer uh, uh, 
takes a look at this market and prices item one and two according to the green Walrasian pricing. And now assume that Alice comes first to the market. Notice that Alice is actually indifferent between item one and two. She, der she derives a utility of one from both items. So this is a tie, and, she, and so she might as well choose item two instead of item one. But in this case, when Bob arrives, only item one is left for him, and it's way too expensive for him. He has value one for it, and it costs R minus one. And think of R as a very, very large number. So Bob will decide not to take anything, and so the social welfare that we end up with is one compared to the optimum, which is R plus one. And in fact, not only does the uh, Walvesian well, pricing not work, but Cohen Haddad et al. from a paper in EC16 showed that no static pricing whatsoever can achieve more than two thirds fraction of the optimal social welfare, even when restricted to unit demand buyers. Now in this work, we really want to optimize social welfare. We do not care about approximations. So what can we do? We relax the model a bit and we allow the designer have more power by allowing him to update prices after every buyer leaves the market and before the next buyer arrives. I want to emphasize that still the arrival order and tie-breaking choices of the buyers is unknown to the uh, seller or designer. But the designer does know at each stage who are the leftover items and who are the buyers who have not yet arrived to the market. Now, a simple observation that I want you to, to uh, notice is that in order to maximize social welfare by dynamic pricing, it is enough to come up with a scheme that computes the first round prices. Now, what do we want from the first round prices? We want uh, uh, these prices to, to guarantee that no matter who is the first buyer to arrive and which favorite bundle he, he chooses, this partial allocation that we get after the first round is consistent with some optimal allocation. If we have a scheme that uh, uh, computes such prices, then we can uh, uh, apply it recursively uh, in each round uh, to compute the subsequent round uh, uh, prices and the invariant that the partial allocation at each stage is consistent with some optimal allocation will be maintained throughout the process and we will end up with an optimal allocation after the last buyer uh, leaves the market. So this brings us to our definition of a dynamic pricing. A dynamic pricing is a price vector of the items such that for every buyer I, which might as well be the first buyer, and for every bundle S in I's demand, which might as well be the bundle that I chooses to take, there is some optimal allocation A such that AI equals S. And I want you to compare this with the definition of a Walrasian pricing, which is a price vector P for which there is some optimal allocation A such that for every I, the bundle AI that is allocated to I is a favorite bundle of I. Now, these two definitions may look similar, but in fact, no one implies the other. We have an example of a market which has a well-resin pricing, but not a dynamic pricing, and the other way around as well. But we already know much about the power and limits of well-resin equilibrium. This is a very well-researched solution concept, whereas we don't know much about dynamic pricing. And the goal of this project is precisely to understand the power and limits of dynamic pricing as we do about well resin equilibrium. This brings us to what we know about the guaranteed existence of well resin equilibria. On the positive side, we know that every market with growth substitutes valuations always admits a well resin equilibrium. This is the green area in the diagram below. On the negative side, we know that if V1 is a valuation which is not growth substitutes, then there are unit demand valuations V2 to Vn, such that the obtained market V1 to Vn has no all resin equilibrium. This is the famous uh, 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 theorem by Gulen Stachetti from 99, 
Uh, and so essentially for valuation classes that contain unit demand, we know everything there is to know about the guaranteed existence of Walrasian pricings or equilibria. Now I want to mention that in 2017, Young, in a JET paper, found a bug in the original proof of the gulen stachetti theorem, and he proved an alternative and incomparable theorem. Um, and now I want to, take, to talk about the state of the art for dynamic pricing. On the positive side, we know that every market with unit demand valuations always admits a dynamic pricing. This is, uh, again, from the paper by Cohen and Adad et al. But besides this, we have no other general result for dynamic pricing. This brings us to our results. We show on the positive side that every market with up to three multi-demand valuations admits a dynamic pricing. En route, we characterize the structure of optimal allocations in multi-demand markets of any, of any size. So this is the green uh, dotted area over uh, here uh, symbolizes the result, and it's only uh, dotted because the result holds only for up to three multi-demand buyers. And more than that, we don't know, it's still open. On the negative side, we show the uh, dynamic pricing uh, variant of the gulen stachetti theorem, that if V1 is not growth substitutes, then there are unit demand valuations V2 to Vn, such that the obtained market has no dynamic pricing. And for multi-demand markets for more, with more than three buyers, and more generally, growth substitutes buyers, uh, the question is still open, whether there is always, whether, uh, uh, there is always uh, dynamic pricing uh, for valuation uh, profiles consi consisting entirely of valuations from these classes. Furthermore, we proved the original theorem of Gurren Stachetti as it was originally stated. And for the rest of the talk, I want to focus on the positive uh, uh, result. First, I would like to uh, do a quick recap of the dynamic pricing solution for union demand buyers by Cohen Adad et al. So what do they do? First, they compute some optimal allocation x, x1 to xn, where xi is the item allocated to buyer i. Then they construct some directed edge-weighted graph, which I'm going to call the preference graph. And in this graph, the items are the vertices. And at the beginning, there is a directed edge between every two vertices. And I want you to think of uh, the edge xi to xj as representing a preference constraint, requiring that once the prices are output by the algorithm, buyer i will strongly prefer xi over xj. Or in other words, the utility from xi given the prices p will be bigger than the utility that i derives from xj given p. Now, an observation that uh, Cohen Adal et al. make in their work is that zero weight cycles in the preference graph correspond to alternative optimal allocations. So what do I mean by this? Let's assume that uh, this red cycle on the right is a zero weight cycle. So what they show is that the allocation obtained from X by transferring the items back in the reverse direction of the cycle, uh, this allocation is still optimal. And they use this observation to do the following. First, they remove every edge that participates in some zero weight cycle in the graph. So this red cycle will, be, will disappear in the algorithm. This allows them to compute prices that satisfy the remaining edge constraints. And so the first buyer is always guaranteed to take an item consistent with some optimal allocation. So to see this, consider again the example uh, from the right. Uh, let's assume that player one comes first. If player one takes x1, great. This is consistent with the optimal allocation x that we started with. If on the other hand, player one didn't take x1, 
Let's assume that he took the item X7. What does this mean if he took X7? It means that player one does not strongly prefer X1 over X7. Otherwise, he would have taken X1 instead of X7. Or in other words, X7 is not a favorite bundle of buyer one if this is the case. But if he took X7, then uh, but uh, then this means that the directed edge from X1 to X7 was removed in the algorithm. It's not there. But if it was removed, then this means that it is a part of some zero weight cycle in the graph, which in turn by the observation means that there is some optimal allocation in which buyer one takes X7. So if buyer one took X7, then this is also fine. This is also consistent with an optimal allocation. And so this in a nutshell concludes the solution by, uh, by Cohen Adal et al. Every buyer is guaranteed to take an item that is consistent with some optimal allocation. And the question is if we can generalize this to multi-demand markets. And uh, there is a very natural way to try to generalize the approach for unit demand to multi-demand markets. And I want to go over this approach. So let's assume that for every I, VI is KI demand. So what we will do as a direct generalization of the previous solution is to first compute some optimal allocation A, A1 to AN, where the bundle AI has size at most KI. Now we will construct a preference graph based on A, as in the unit demand solution. So again, the vertices are the items, and there is a directed edge between every two uh, items that belong to different uh, buyers. As in the previous solution, zero weight cycles here will correspond to alternative optimal allocations. And the question is whether removing zero weight cycles uh, and computing the prices will give us what we want, will give us that, uh, the buy, that uh, no matter which buyer arrives first, he will take uh, some bundle consistent with an optimal allocation. And now I want to go over an example that shows why the unit demand approach completely fails for unit demand markets. So let's assume uh, the following example in which there is uh, three buyers, buyers one, two, and three, Buyer one is two, de uh, two demand, buyer two is two demand, and buyer three is also two, uh, buyer three is unit demand, sorry. And there are five items, V, W, X, Y, and Z, and the valuation profile is written in the table in front of you. And you can verify that the allocation that gives V and W to buyer one, X and Y to buyer two, and uh, uh, Z to buyer three is an optimal allocation that uh, obtains a social welfare of five. And you can also verify that uh, in the preference graph that we get from uh, uh, in this uh, profile, this red and uh, green cycle will have zero weight. So for example, if we take the red cycle and we uh, uh, transfer the items back in the reverse direction of the cycle, the allocation that we get will still have social welfare of five. Uh, that is, it will still be optimal. So if we follow uh, uh, our approach and remove the zero weight cycles, then what will happen now is that buyer one might not prefer V over X and W over Y. So what can happen now is that if uh, uh, player one comes first, he might take X and Y instead of V and W. But if this happens, then now buyer two is only left with one item, Z, that gives him any value. And so the maximum possible uh, social welfare at this point is at most four, instead of the uh, best possible a priori, which is five. And the problem here is that cycles can collide. Both cycles collided at uh, the item Z. And so when buyer one uh, stole uh, items X and Y uh, from buyer two, uh, uh, instead of taking V and W, Buyer two needed to compensate for these items being stolen by taking items Z. But item Z can only compensate for one item. There is only one Z. And so this problem was not present at all in the unit demand uh, solution. Uh, because there, since, I, since buyers were unit demand, each buyer takes only one item. And so we only needed to consider just one cycle in the analysis. <laughs> 
And so this approach, which works for unit demand, completely fails uh, in multi-demand markets. Now, what is our challenge? The unit demand solutions solution removed the entire zero weight cycles uh, from the graph. That is every edge that participates in some zero weight cycle. We, what we want to do is we want to remove enough edges pro from the preference graph, not necessarily all edges that participate in a zero weight cycle. And we want to do so such that on the one hand, no zero weight cycles will be left. So we want to remove enough edges such that no zero weight cycles will be left. But on the other hand, we don't want to remove too many edges uh, so that the edge removals will still be consistent with optimal allocations. We don't want to allow the buyers too much freedom to deviate from their bundles uh, to other bundles that are not consistent with optimal allocations. And to do this, we must first gain a better understanding of how these optimal allocations look like in multi-demand markets. This brings us to, a def to our definition of legal items and allocations. So an item X is called legal for buyer I if there is some optimal allocation in which X is allocated to I. And an allocation A is called legal if every item is legal for the player it is allocated to. And the theorem that we prove is that in a multi-demand market, an allocation is legal if and only if it is optimal. So in other words, if we take an allocation such that every item is allocated to a player that also receives it in some other alloc allocation which is optimal, then uh, this allocation is optimal as well. And so in a sense, what this uh, theorem means is that for the sake of optimizing social welfare, the specific values of the items to the buyers do not matter at all. The only relevant information about, uh, about an item, again, for the sake of maximizing social welfare, is who are the players that receive it in some optimal allocation. And essentially, two items are exactly equivalent if they are legal for the same set of players. And so what we do next is we partition the items into equivalence classes based on the sets of players that they are legal to. So for every uh, set, uh, subset of players C, uh, we define the equivalence class B sub C to be the set of all items X such that C is exactly the set of players for which X is legal to. And we refine this, uh, these equivalence classes by intersecting them with the bundles AI from the initial optimal location. So BI comma C will be AI intersected with BC. And so in the example from two slides ago, the uh, non-empty equivalence classes that we end up with are these uh, orange balls over here. So for example, the item V is in the equivalence class B1 comma 1, 3, because it is allocated to buyer one in the allocation we started with, A. And there also exists an alternative optimal allocation in which it is allocated to buyer three. But there is no um, optimal allocation in which it is allocated to buyer two. So V belongs to the equivalence class B1, comma, the set one, three, and the same thing goes for W. Now an observation that uh, follows directly from the definitions is the following. Suppose the item XJ belongs to the equivalence class BJCJ. Then XJ is legal for buyer I, if and only if I belongs to CJ. With this observation in mind, we define uh, the item equivalence graph in which the items are these non-empty sets, BIC. Again, each of these uh, sets is an equivalence class containing items. And there will be an edge BICI to BJCJ whenever the item I belongs to CJ. So in the example from before, the item equivalence graph we get is uh, the one on the right. We prove that zero weight cycles in the preference graph correspond to cycles in the item equivalence graph. And the conclusion is that in order to remove zero weight cycles in the preference graph, which is what we want in the first place, 
It is enough to first remove all cycles in the item equivalence graph and translate these removals back to the uh, uh, preference graph. So if, for example, we decide to remove the edge between B221 and B332, this will correspond to deleting the edges between X to Z and Y to Z. Now, what I want you to take uh, from this is that the item equivalence graph provides a very compact uh, view compared to the preference graph. It hides away all the irrelevant information about items. And so for n equals three, for example, whereas the number of items can be very, very, very large, and, uh, and so the uh, valuation profile can be very hard to reason about, the item equivalence graph will contain at most 12 non-empty vertices. And since it is such a small graph, it is easier to think about and reason about it. And what our solution for uh, three players does is show how to remove the cycles in this simple item equivalence graph and translate these removals back to the, to the preference graph. And, uh, and uh, the way we decide which edges to move has to do with the sizes of the different equivalence classes. So to summarize, what we did uh, in the positive result is constructed tools that allow us to take a high level view of multi-demand markets. This is the le legal if and only if optimal theorem and the item equivalence graph. These tools are valid for every number of buyers n. We leverage these tools to get a dynamic pricing for three multi-demand buyers. And the negative result, which we only mentioned, shows that no dynamic pricing is guaranteed beyond growth substitutes. Now, the open questions that we have is first whether we can use the tools above for other objectives in the, uh, that have to do with multi-demand markets. And as for dynamic pricing, it is still open whether, there is, uh, whether dynamic pricing is guaranteed to exist for more than three multi-demand buyers and more generally for growth substitute buyers. So with this, I'll end and thank you very much.